Hello? Hi. M Mark, this is Mike Stump. How are you? I'm doing good. How about you, Mark? Well, so far so good today. Yeah, am I, 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 you know, I'm new to the technology, so I don't know, hopefully, the, about sharing screen or whatever. Oh, okay, somebody well, else. You're doing better than most people the first time around. Oh, thank you very much. I was a blank. Ah, hi, Ed. There's my pal, Ed. Hey, how's it going? Hi, Ed. My name's Mike Stump. Hi, Mike. How are you doing? Well, it's a nice day to chat. It certainly is. It's always a nice day to chat. Yeah. How's the weather in Germany? <laughs> Actually, today, uh, very nice, uh, oddly enough. Oh, we've had, uh, yeah, we've high 70s, sunny. It's a little cloudy now, but we've actually got something of a summer for a change. Oh, nice. Good. Yeah. And uh, where are you located? Riverside, California. Oh. No kidding. Yeah. Hmm? My uh, my father is buried in Riverside. It's oh, a, at the at the the cemetery that's in this. No kidding, that's amazing. Yeah, the military seminar seminar. Hmm? Oh, oh, Arlington. <laughs> yeah, maybe that's Arlington. what we're doing then. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, at hmm? Arlington. Yeah. Yeah, and and my mother, both of them were there. Yeah, I've heard you speak about your father and listening in some of the conversations when oh. you talked about your father. Uh, Especially uh, that uh, YouTube on communication. That was really an interesting one. <laughs> I don't I don't remember. That's fine. That's fine. <laughs> At our age we don't have to, Mark. <laughs> no. We don't, have, we don't have to make an effort to live in the moment. No, We're already no, there. It's, it's an option. If it works, it's great. If not, eh, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> Less and less. I remember if I don't write if I don't write it down, it's gone. <laughs> and that go. I I I've kept a journal for almost twenty years, hmm. but now at it, 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 the beginning of the day, or at the end. Anyway, I write down if I take a shower, if I do the dishes, hmm. if I so that I. Otherwise, I seriously, I forget. Did I take a shower? Yes. Do I need to wash my hair? Mm. Crazy, but I do it just to keep, you know, just keep track of things, you know, keep everything <laughs> ordered. <laughs> That's right. A little ordered and never hurt. <laughs> hey, hello. Boy, I'll tell you, he's just jumping right in here. Everybody, it's just chaos. <laughs> Oh boy, we're gonna have fun. <laughs> we, our task is to make order out of chaos. That's yeah. the great. That's least, the creativity. <laughs> that's the creativity. Uh, yeah, at least I, I attempt to. Well, I, I I think I wrote that down on my to do list, but I have to find it. To so, how you doing, Darwin? Glad to see you here. Yeah, I'm doing. I'm doing okay. All right. Yeah, I, I'm glad that uh, when I first came on, I thought you had to. You know, it's, this was only for bearded men with glasses. For a bit. <laughs> <laughs> I know there's always a few people that spoil. There was a uniform of the day. It was posted on the bulletin board, and some people didn't see yeah. it. The beard sounds like that's still required, but. Uh, <laughs> Glasses yeah. are optional, so no, that's right. <laughs> yeah, uh, those two fellows there, they're not old enough. It's old. Yeah. <laughs> I, I always have the option ready just in case. Yeah. Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> yeah. Marco has some that have false eyebrows and <laughs> big red nose. <laughs> that's uh, uh couple couple sessions ago, was it that we talked about time mm -hmm. uh, and you know whether it exists or whatever uh, mm -hmm. and how you keep track of it I think uh, by our biology does a pretty good job of, of uh, 
keeping track of time for us. I sure know when I have to go to the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, anytime I pass one. <laughs> glasses, gla glasses are probably the first thing. Yeah, they came on pretty early. The, the eyes are the first thing to, to need help. Mm. And, uh, and then, you know, and now, you know, my mind needs help. Mm. So, well, I've had people tell me all my life my mind needs help. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty sure you probably heard the same. <laughs> uh, Sometimes you have to consider the source that's telling you. Yeah, yeah. No, I think you always have to consider the source. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. We're just joking around, Marco. We're, we, we can get serious. Uh, no, we don't have to. That's tough. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if the topic's depression, we don't want to get too serious too quickly. We just yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, I I wanted to make the point at the beginning, but it doesn't seem like it's necessary that this should not be construed by anyone as some sort of therapy. Mm -hmm. It's just bunch of guys with beards and glasses talking, <laughs> <laughs> talking having a conversation and mm. it should not you know be be taken for some sort of therapy yeah absolutely and i should just own that i currently am a certified therapist master's level mm. therapist so i don't know how long i'll have that certification but at the moment i do um Certified Integral Therapist, whatever that's worth. Uh, mm -hmm. So, yeah. But and, even though I have that, I'm not looking at this as I'm here and I'm going to, you know, do group therapy. I'm not looking at it that way. Good. Uh, yeah. I, I might share some information and resources. You know, that's usually, that's usually the limitation I put around, you know, uh, things is that um, I, you know, I'll share information and resources but not get involved in, you know, a therapeutic process, that kind of thing. So, Are you in Boulder, Derwin? Uh, North Vancouver. I'm in Vancouver, B.C., Canada. Thank you. Oh, okay. Boy, we are. Yeah, we're all spread out. Where are you? <laughs> uh, yeah. I know uh, where. Uh, I don't know where Michael or Mark. I haven't had face-to-face -face yet, so I don't know where you guys are based. Um, I'm in I'm in Riverside, California. Okay. Great. And I'm I'm about twenty miles uh, north east. No, south. southeast of Marco. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. It's why they have trouble meeting up. <laughs> <laughs> well, my father lives in Denver, so yeah. So I certainly have a Colorado connection. Yeah. Am I correct in, in asserting that there are three therapists here, actually? Or are these people with therapeutic profession, professional therapeutic backgrounds? Um, I don't know. Mm. I, I don't have I don't know if I'm one of them, but I'm definitely not. <laughs> you're not, Doug? You, you're no, no, no. You're though, right? You, you work... I do underground therapy, I suppose, <laughs> on myself. I like that, Doug. Man. I like that. <laughs> It goes with the undercover agent type of stuff, but no, there's no certification. There's no uh, whatever. I work as a contractor for the state, um, which has nothing to do with therapy, but it ends up being therapy in a lot of ways because these are stressed out individuals. Um, Is it social the, work technically? It would be technically social work, yes. Okay. And, but Mark, you... Uh, I've, been on, it, I've been on both sides of the, okay. the couch. <laughs> oh sure well me too i mean it, i think that just it's probably a good, <laughs> good what about you michael what's your background uh my background is uh, i have been in therapy and taking what i learned from therapy and been a good friend and used it when uh talking to others when they have issues that come up okay ed do you, I don't think you have a, you're, you're not a professional. I'm not, I'm not a therapist. Kind of I was, I was, a, I was a teacher for a while. Yeah. I started out as an English teacher in my life. Oh, wow. Um, but I never taught English in, in, 
I took a degree in English in America, but never taught English there. And then I stayed in Germany after the military, and I taught English as a foreign language for eight years at a private boarding school, uh, where there were a lot of, um, we had either exceedingly rich kids or exceedingly poor kids that were being supported by the state. So what you do is is very therapy-like for the most part, but it's, in, it's engaging humans at, at, at a really human level. And then I spent 14 years in Silicon Valley as an engineer when I don't have any, I never took a course in engineering. And then when I came back to Germany, I spent uh, 18 years working for a vocational training company that uh, first as a product manager developing IT uh, courses um, were mostly for unemployed people. But the last 10 years I spent uh, engaged in European projects that were trying to harmonize vocational qualifications uh, throughout the European Union. So hmm. it's not, uh, yeah, it, it was a lot, of, it was a lot of fun. And it was certainly a, a very interesting kind of thing that we were doing. But I think any time that you're engaged with other human beings, there's some aspect of what you do that is therapeutic, whether you know it or not, whether you admit it or not, whether you like it or not. I because, concur. I concur. Yeah, yeah. Just just dealing with other people is is sometimes really, it's great. I love that. That's why I show up here every Tuesday whenever I can. But on the other hand, there's always a challenge to it because you never know, you know, and that's the thing I like about people. You never know what's going to come. And and sometimes, depending on the degree of relationship you have, you can get really involved. I've had, I've had people, you know, over a beer in a bar um, tell me things that I probably wouldn't have told a therapist, <laughs> even if I wanted to go there. But but it, but it comes out and that you just deal with whatever you're there whenever you're there. And, and sometimes you feel halfway qualified to do that. I never did. But <laughs> but you just, you know, my feeling was just engage them at the human level and, you know, see how far you can get. So far, I, I got out of it unscathed. Nobody, you know, decided they needed to punch me in the nose. But, <laughs> but that's happened, too. <laughs> well, your nose looks in good shape. It is in good shape. It was only a couple of times. <laughs> yeah. Well, I uh, personally, from my experience, and I'm, I have attempted suicide, and conversation is therapeutic on a lot of levels. Um, I don't know if I'm stepping up over a boundary here, but just to try to. <clears throat> speak to the issue of suicide and depression that I have personal experience, experience from my own life is that um, it was 32 years ago and it was brought on by a lot of convergence of having a son being involved with his mother, my lover, and we married and just not knowing how the fuck to go to the next step. Mm. I don't know what else to say. A lot of dynamics you guys have talked about in different ways that I wasn't prepared to deal with. And um, I sent Marco a poem and I, I'm hoping it can be posted once we work out the details, but the title of the poem that I wrote for this was tall, called hanging, hanging with pain without choking, because I tried to hang myself. Mm. And um, <clears throat> as you know, um, <laughs> I'm not choking, but I can feel the memory of it, uh, of literally, in all intents and purposes, just wanted to kill the fucking pain I was feeling. I don't know if I wanted to end my life, but I know I wanted to kill the pain. Not a good way to deal with pain. So right now, uh, I'll leave it at that. I just, that's as much as I can say right now. We'll, we'll work on the, on the, po on the technical uh, issues. Um, okay. But, uh, 
I thought it would be important to talk about our backgrounds because the term depression is already a loaded term, if you will. It, it has you know, a number of meanings on different levels and in different contexts, inc including therapeutic contexts, cultural contexts, um, and historical. I don't know the full you know, semantics or the meaning of, of the word depression, but I think I, I know, and maybe this is what we're here to partly talk about, uh, I know what, that it has a meaning to, m to me in, in my experience and um, in material I've read or in p things that people have shared with me uh, through the course of, of my life. And uh, I, I don't think I've given it much theoretical thought. I don't think I've really talked about it in this kind of a, a, of a context, this more intellectual uh, context, certainly not professionally. I've, in fact, I've never even, I've once been to a therapist in my life and it was in college and I was more or less told not to come back. <laughs> so, um, you too. <laughs> <laughs> one time, one time. It was like, I didn't so, so <laughs> I, I mainly deal with depression through writing, through art. That's my therapy. Yeah. Uh, and um, it's been a, a, um, a torturous path, I'll say, but an effective one for what it's worth. Uh, I'm still here. And so um, I think part of the idea here would, would be to explore what that whole arc is or what that, that whole circle is of depression of and the other side of it because mm -hmm. there's something wanted or Abindo writes about this in The Life Divine, I believe, or maybe it's Banerjee, but, but even the self-negation is the expression of a kind of affirmation. Yes. But the individual, the limited individual, this is putting it in his language, doesn't see it that way from the perspective of Brahman or supermind or you know, truth consciousness. Uh, one can discern, discern, this is Aurobindo again, uh, the, the affirmation in the negation. But that's a very mystical understanding of it. And that's not, I think, the way that the depressed person experiences it and so we're talking about th this conversation was prompted by a specific event culturally uh which mark you brought to our attention uh or at least like brought into the conversation and that was the suicide of anthony Bourdain. Bourdain. so would you want to i don't know introduce where you want to sure. go with that um it has, you know, it's multifaceted. We've fleshed some of it out, but I haven't felt quite clear on what the core question is. Well, I, uh, to pick up on that, the core question is, is, is why do people do that? Uh, I think there's a self-preservation instinct within human nature, otherwise it'd be way more common than it is because maybe 50% of the population experiences depression, uh, but very few people commit to it successfully. And, 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 and if, I, if I go too far in talking, Michael, you just, Give me a signal or something. Say, so, I, 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 I'm here to just listen to everybody. I'm, oh. I'm, I'm good, Mark. Don't worry about it. So, so one question is, why isn't it more common if depression is all we're talking about? Uh, there is a, a theory. It's called interpersonal psychological theory of suicide. And I think it's spot on. It's by uh, uh, Thomas Joyner, uh, first put it out. And there's, a, there's three, three factors that have to converge for the act to, to, uh, to be carried out. 
And I see it. I, I see Anthony Bourdain checking all those, those three boxes. Or think of it as a Venn diagram. Uh, and only in that small place where the three factors intersect is when the act is carried to its uh, completion. And the, basically the, the three factors are uh, isolation or uh, alienation and the, I think that speaks to if we go to Maslow's hierarchy of human needs uh, one of them, the third one is, is belongingness, affiliation, uh, feeling loved. Uh, okay, so the second circle is burdensomeness. And that is, you feel that you're a burden to people who care about you. Uh, and this couldn't, I think this is where the depression comes in. Some people are, are, are more prone to having negative self thoughts that they're a burden to, to people. Uh, and that may be a cog cognitive distortion or it, it may in fact be true. Uh, and the, the third circle in the diagram is you lose the, that instinct of self-preservation, usually through, I don't want to get too technical, but through, through desensitization of pain in other you have a high pain threshold and this can be build up through the years uh or or in the case of of i think the people i mentioned thompson wallace ordain uh hemingway is they experience see, experience so much uh, human death and dying and, and pain that they become desensitized to it and think that it's, it, they can manage it. And so they no longer fear uh, dying. So when those three things converge, and that's very rare, uh, that's when somebody does it. And you could and and success uh, doesn't have anything to do with it. Uh, like Anthony Bourdain, he was uh, I, everybody. Everybody thought really highly of him. I, I can't find anybody who didn't. Uh, but he was on the he was he was on the road like most all the time alone in, in hotel rooms. And, and, and he had a crew, two cameramen and a producer that he worked with. And I haven't heard anything from them. My sense is as, as popular as he was and as admired and well-liked that he didn't have that close friendship. He, he had, an 11 year old daughter, but he was divorced from his wife. And it wasn't that long ago that they split up. And, and currently he had a much younger uh, female uh, uh, girlfriend. He was 61, she's 42. And, and she comes from, a, 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 I think she was Italian. And she's an actress and an activist and a very eccentric person. And she had been, I, I posed the one question about, uh, you know, what role does the media play in these things? Uh, 
and and specifically in that case, she was she was not with him. Sometimes she went to that's where he met her on on one of his uh, uh, you know shoots, I think in Italy, and and she he was interviewing her during the the program. So that's and they had a chemistry, and and. So they started up a relationship, and, and sometimes I think she would travel with them. Uh, but this particular time in Paris, she was somewhere else and posting on Instagram and just all kinds of provocative things and maybe running around with somebody, you know, someone else. And uh, I think you, you I think... It's, very likely that all those three things converged at that alone in his hotel room. Uh, you know, and he, it, and he was a, a, a drinker and, a, and, and struggled with, with depression and things like that. So I think, I think that's what happened with, and, and you can see it with Wallace. You can see all these people, they, they have, fame, but they're, they don't have that, that connection that I, I called it a steadfast friendship that can see you through. Uh, like, like, like you were saying, Marco, it's a, you just don't talk, you just don't talk about these things with people. You know, when you go dark, it, you don't, you know, it's not like uh, you like to talk about it. You like to pr- present yourself as, as good. And, you know, li- you, you want to be thought of highly. And, and darkness is, is when you're depressed, you don't want to, you know. Can I say something, Mark? Sure. Um, I really like. The three, I I need to get the title of that book and read it because it's spot on as far as my experience, uh, the the way it crossed over. um, But coming on the other side of of this issue and through it, and you're right, the person themselves goes dark. And they're partially responsible for that. But one of the things I have to say is that because people don't want to talk about it, there's only been a few friends on the other side coming out that were willing to sit with me and listen to me talk about it. This is the interpersonal thing that I think is spot on that we're losing. Of of I, I Out of my experience, I've been able to listen to friends that I know, six cents or whatever, they could be very close to severe depression or more. And that's why I really value you bringing up the subject because the other side of it is how well are people willing to listen to it? Because part of it, it, it reminds them of themselves. And it's, it's a struggle to listen to somebody in pain as much as it is a struggle to listen to ourselves in pain, if I can say it that way. So, yeah, uh, go ahead, Marco. Well, um, you identified these three factors the com- at the convergence of which, uh, you know, all the boxes are checked, if you will, uh, to enable this really radical act, right? Because you're countermanding, countervening the self preservation instinct, which is the strongest instinct that we know, ar- arguably. But it seems to me that there are other conditions kind of that conspire around that convergence uh, that would give rise to it in the first place. And those are social cult conditions and cultural conditions and also personal circumstance conditions. Like in all these cases, there are, there's a brokenness in the relationships, it seems. And there isn't a network or a web or um, a uh, a mesh of uh, of communication between even just one other person, but preferably 
more than you know, a group and, and even a, a larger society that you would feel a part of in some way, right? So the alienation is there. Um, you know, what, I'm, I'm not an expert, but it, whenever I read about this or whenever it's re- somebody does it and it's reported in the news, there's talk about how this is an epidemic. It's a, it's a big problem. It's something that nobody's talking about, et cetera, et cetera. And um, I don't hear too much more about what is really underlying that because events just keep on going and, you know, the next news item pops up and you forget about this person's suicide and, until the next one happens and, or something happens in your own life, but that happens in, a, in your own life. It's in a completely different sphere. So I, I, I don't know. I, I, I'm trying to get at maybe what's not really being said that we could bring to the surface that we could you know, look at. I mean, cause we, there's a certain amount of theory, right. That, that could be applied or could be used to understand this. Um, but the, what's going on right now, there, you know, six men uh, of a, you know, a couple of a certain age range and, maybe half in one in one phase of life, the other half in another phase of life. <clears throat> and we're all talking, we're talking about depression. Why? Well, <laughs> I just think that just off the bat is relatively remarkable to get six men to just show up and start talking about the yes. <laughs> yes. Um, You know, maybe I just briefly give a little my own genealogy and hopefully because there's some professional aspect that will shed some light as well that might be useful to others. But um, I went through um, a clinical depression between ages 18, 18, 19 to about 21, 22. Um, And it was bookended by that period. Interestingly was bookended by two, two major losses. So, at the beginning of it, there is the death of the leader of the community, the spiritual community that I was born and raised in. And that affected all the adults, and to a certain extent, me directly, but also but really my parents and, and so on, affected by his death. Um, and then I went through, there was, there was some sexual dynamics in the commune that were a little unusual and cultural things going on. Uh, in terms of how I was interfacing with the mainstream culture. Uh, And then towards the end of that period, my mom actually died. And um, that was the point at which I felt suicidal. I thought, gosh, things have got to get better or I'm going to be out of here. Um, But fortunately, I was able to access uh, a psychologist uh, who was very good and did... um, uh, kind of like what I call matrix therapy. I actually went and lived with them for two and a half weeks. So I recognize how fortunate I was <laughs> to be able to do that, to go live with a psychologist who worked in that way, daily therapy, one to two formal sessions, and then kind of hanging out with this guy and, you know, going to shoot hoops or whatever. Um, and that, really shifted things for me. It was a significant, I had a significant breakthrough with him. Um, and I did take some medication for a bit around that. And it seemed to help the therapy. And then I tapered back off. So, so that was, that was my per- personal experience of a clinical level depression. Um, yeah. And then just in, in the last, you know, and this is like being something that men haven't talked about as we as we're noticing so far you know as we kind of already know but you know men would typically um, go, you know as the saying goes invade a neighboring country rather than <laughs> admit to depression <laughs> so um so that's why i think it's so remarkable because we're not uh invading a neighboring country right now um and uh yeah uh, and then in terms of just some kind of resources and stuff like, you know, many years went by and then I, I sort of, there was this book came out called I Don't Want to Talk About It by Terrence uh, Rial. And that was the first kind of book I, 
saw kind of something getting into the culture on men and depression. Um, and I picked that up and I thought, you know what, gosh, this has been, wow, this has actually been maybe a theme going on here for, for my dad. You know, give me some in, started to get some insight for him. I um, just haven't had a language, you know, no one like, because nobody was talking about it ever. <laughs> um, so it gave me some insight for him about my dad's experience and, and start, you know, in mine and start really thinking, wow, maybe this is partly what's been going on. Um, and then I guess flash forward to, to graduate school. Um, and not until I guess the, in the PhD program level, of counseling psychology here in uh, University of British Columbia. Uh, there was a program for a research program, interdisciplinary, so, you know, multiple, trying to take multiple lenses to look at this issue for uh, women in addiction. And that, on, on the women's side, has been the untalked about issue. There's either idea that women don't suffer from addiction or, you know, it's... They, don't, they haven't talked about that. <laughs> Women haven't wanted to talk about that. But there was, by the time I was in my PhD program, a program specifically to study that. Um, and I actually got into that program and got some funding to study that. Um, but there was nothing for men and depression yet uh, at the, in, in any academic programs outside of the military. So if, you're, if you can fit that role of the military, then you might get some support. But if you're civilian at that point, basically, you know, you're not heroic enough to get support. <laughs> I mean, that's the message you're going to get, right? Um, so, yeah, so at that point, there wasn't anything. Um, so then flash forward a few more years where I actually met Marco for the first time, I think, in person was at this. Uh, so now we're at 2011, the Boulder Integral Center and uh, doing this integral incubator. Um, and I was just trying to figure out what am I going to do in my private practice? And through the course of this week long thing, I thought, you know, men in depression, like I've got to do something. <laughs> and so after that, I built a website focused on men in depression. Um, and, uh, you know, with Marco and, and Kayla helping with the design aspects. Um, so that was my attempt to bring this issue out of the, out of the closet. Um, and now in the last, I would say in the last five or six years, I'm seeing a lot more like there's, you know, there's a whole, there's funding there in Canada for specifically for men in depression. Now um, there's websites going up, there's research programs starting. Um, you know, if I was, if I was focused, I could, and I wanted to do a PhD right now, I could probably go do one at UBC. I have to be in another department, but, you know, there's at least one guy that's doing that. Um, and, uh, yeah, so in that sense, that's quite hopeful to see that that's changed quite a bit in the last, uh, over the last period of years. Um, yeah, so I honestly don't quite know where I was going with all that. But Can I, want I ask to a technical question? Sure. Uh, so you said that you suffered from clinical depression and I, yeah that's how I described it I would say but is there a technical definition to what constitutes clinical depression compared to com depression in its common usage you know where I someone might just say I feel depressed but that's not the same right. as being clinically depressed well I would say the duration so yeah so I mean you know when we're in practice and Mark would know this and you know there's screening assessments that we do um i worked for five years you know with our national um employee assistance provider and uh you know we would screen everybody um and there's you know a series of questions about um related to self-esteem related to eating sleeping patterns um now I'm going to forget them all <laughs> right now, but, uh, you know, uh, emotions, lo loss of motivation, loss of interest. Um, probably not enough on relationships, uh, but they, you know, you ask about recent losses, um, past history, that kind of thing. So, yeah. So most of the, um, 
you know, professional contexts will include regular um, uh, depression screening these days. Uh, maybe not necessarily in people in private practice, but anything that's kind of organized um, is probably going to have that. And typically, it's a period of time that you've had got like five out of nine of these symptoms. Um, sleep disruption, uh, losing or gaining weight, change, uh, significant changes in appetite, significant changes in thought patterns towards uh, permanent uh, causation, very personal, taking overly personal responsibility, sense of pervasiveness of bad things. So bad things are happening across all spheres of my life, not able to compartmentalize anymore in time and space. Um, that's some of the real cognitive aspects of it. Yeah, so someone who has five or nine of these over two weeks, they'll say that's sort of clinical. Is that, am I sort of in the ballpark there, Mark? I think you. Uh, yeah. that's exactly it. Yeah. I mean, it's usually if like a, a t over a two-week span, if, if these symptoms are persistent over a duration, you know, it's not just, couple days or something you're not just sad of an ex something happened and you you you're you know your mood goes down but it, so two weeks if it's just if it's if you stay down there yeah and sleep disturbance eating the the trouble is uh, it it's a uh, a, a self-report you're it, the person has to <laughs> Have some self awareness and 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 be and and I I think if people were like you asked the question if you're aware of the symptoms and oh I'm doing this uh, and it's lasting and you're not hiding it and then you can yeah you can go go seek help. But again, men don't do that. They act, they act it out more than than yeah. seek help. That's just the way we're sort of. I don't know. I, I, I don't know if that's cultural or I, it's probably universal. Well, it's also it's also a mix. It's a mix of culture, and I can speak to my own family uh, influence as far as my dad being diagnosed with manic depression and so it was modeled to me right. i remember i remember my um mother sent me to my dad's doctor because she was concerned that i was manic depression like my dad and i was 26 at the time this was before i even attempted my suicide um I went to see him and spent an hour and a half with him and he explained it to this way. And this is, this actually was inspiring to me. Mike, you don't, I guess, don't have the markers for manic depression, but you were fathered by one. So you mimic the behavior that turned a light on that. I had a certain, and like it's trying to awareness that it's, it's not beyond my, capacity to choose differently how I respond because part of my issue was with my God, God bless my mom, but she was sometimes saying, you're just like your father, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and that sons get sometimes, but having, uh, but it was her that sent me there. So I got to thank her for it too. Yeah. So, so I, I think it's a very mixed very mixed on different social genes, whatever. It's a mixed bag, and that's why it's necessary. And thankfully, I found slowly but surely uh, people that could uh, model and mirror to me and help me um, work with it, like Derwin's has indicated. Hey, guys, I just got to let you know that uh, we're in the middle here of a huge thunderstorm, and there's there's hail falling wow. uh, everywhere right now. So if I get disconnected, uh, that's <laughs> there's also appar apparently a tornado watch, not wow. a watch uh, for this area. So, uh, all right, thank you. Yep. Yeah.
You if, you go, if you go dark, <laughs> you won't freak out. It's for no other reason in reality. Okay. No. Anyway, thank you guys. Thank you, Mike. I might try to piece together a few things here for at least me and what um, you've said, Michael and uh, Mark and Derwin too. Um, but essentially, what we're kind of saying is that we see different aspects of reality. As you're saying, Michael, you were kind of not necessarily you didn't wake up, a light, maybe just a light bulb switched on when that therapist said, well, this, this is what your father went through, but like, if mm -hmm. you're aware of it, then maybe you'll have a chance of seeking out when you are in that kind of tormented state, you can seek out maybe an okay state, not necessarily jump to enlightenment or um, whatever, but... I just want to be so, normal. <laughs> yeah, just have a, the, the normal kind of day-to-day -day scale that most... Uh, even saying normal people is kind of strange to say, but uh, we, we, I'd say like Mark, what you were saying, there's, if, if there was 50% depressed people walking around and 50% um, happy people, then perhaps 50% of the people would just wipe themselves out because they'd be in, but they're not in that state all the time. And I'd say that all of us here, anybody listening, anybody out there right now, um, Maybe it's 51, 49, 51 good states that we're in, 49 bad states, and that's enough to keep the balance going in, in the human, humanity's favor there or something. But, um, well, but, I think, it, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I think no, it's go ahead. important. I think uh, part, of, part of it is cultural in that, uh, in, in the America specifically, but the West in, in general. I don't think you have this problem of depression in, uh, I gotta pick the word, less advanced civilizations or cultures. There's so much pressure. Or hyper, hyperactive cultures maybe. If you want to. Yeah, there's so much there's so much pressure in in if you go back in time and and even to to different countries or or take africa or something where it's still tribal they don't suffer this kind of uh this darkness because there are they are connected to people who, who it just doesn't happen so often. And it does tend to, to run in families. There's a genetic component for certain, and that would be uh, the feeling part, the depression part. But it's also modeled. Like mm -hmm. you're on, on, the, uh, on the inventory you take, if your father committed suicide, if your mother did, that elevates the chances that you will because of the modeling and so it, it, and i think that's you see it in our culture like you have kate spade and then you have and then bourdain follows and and particularly with young kids it can it can kind of like a virus run through a a population in a in a school or something like that and going uh, back on what Michael said about we're losing the interpersonal. That, that's one of the reasons I'm, I'm here at this cafe too, is I, I don't necessarily need, I mean, I love everybody here, but I was doing all right reading books on my own, but I do need some form of connection. I, mean, I have my family and that's great, but in Kentucky, which I noted, there's, there's quite a bit of a bubble going on and maybe that's, a lot of parts of the South or rural culture that's been left behind. There's this sense of alienation that going back to, was it Thomas Joyner? You said there's, there's the isolation. Yes. These, and it's mostly men or younger males that are experiencing this. 
and it, it's a cycle because the pre previous generation, everybody is losing jobs or um, just the culture in general is pretty nasty, if you want to phrase it that way. And these the, the men, younger men are going to live with their parents. They're feeling like a burden to others. And then there's the desensitization desensitization of uh, whatever you said, but uh, they're resorting to, I don't know, video games or even more isolation, drugs or alcoholism, because there's no hope, there's whatever, but that doesn't necessarily mean they're all depressed. And um, I don't know where I'm going with this, but. <laughs> <laughs> I tend to es eschew the psychotherapeutic language when I think about my own interior states because I feel like um, what was that big word you used? <laughs> it was a <laughs> short word. S-U-S-U-S-C-H-E-W. I know the word is just I want to make sure. If I really I wanted to be snooty I would say S-U. There you go. There you go. So you made an issue of my SU. Uh, <laughs> but I, I, I see how useful it is for working with a population. Like you're uh, in a treatment center. Uh, you're uh, working in an institution of any kind. And you're dealing with all kinds of people that you don't have the time to really get to know, to really develop a relationship with. You have to make an assessment about their internal states based upon some kind of external uh, symptoms or indications or tendencies that, that they might show or report, right? Now, you can, we haven't talked about the brain science, but I'm assuming that there are neurological correlates to these interior states that mm -hmm. you know, could show up in different ways on yep. CAT scans, CAT scans, et cetera. Um, I, 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 I think one of the problems with talking about depression is that it can be depressing. To, to talk about. <laughs> yeah, that's that. Yes, yes, so, yes. Like this is David Foster Wallace wrote a story called "The Depressed Person." You know the story, right? Right, Mark. But it's base. It's told well. His, it basically all his his <laughs> writing was a suicide note. I, Arguably true. Um, this story in particular is interesting from a literary point of view because in its structure, it mirrors the kind of inwardly circling kind of cyclical thinking of the depressed person, this kind of self-fulfilling prophecy of um, speaking from that point of view of being depressed and then reinforcing the point of view of being depressed. And then because you're depressed and your energy is low and kind of needy it becomes repulsive to other people so that increases your alienation they don't they don't want to hear you going on and on about you know the these stories that uh are all some kind of variation i think on an imprisonment or uh being trapped or uh not having a you know having a future the the, the piece that um that john shared was a chapter from um some kind of textbook uh but it was called on time experience and depression and the basic point of this is that depression is a being caught in stories that are based in the past uh and feeling unable to get out and feeling like possibilities have been foreclosed uh and and it becomes a sort of inwardly collapsed point really um so i think one of the challenges in speaking about depression is to find the way through the depressive space, like to kind of thread through it so that you don't like fall in, like you don't get lost in it, even as you're like trying to talk about it because like you can be clinical and be sort of detached from it, but then you don't really get to the essence of it. Or you could be really first person and involved in your story but then there's the risk of getting lost in it so where is that like golden thread that lets you ex explore understand talk about the space but then also sort of come out the other side with with some 
you know, it's something that's beyond that, that state, like, because we don't just want to be depressed all the time. I mean, or, or maybe we do. I mean, cause that's one of the things too, about depression in, at least in my experience is there's a desire to be depressed. And so, so when I want to just pay attention to that, when I may feel that desire arising because it, it, be, it can become a kind of safe place actually to be within your own cocoon of, of morbidity. Um, as Have a, you ever heard of, Mark, I, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Darren. No, I just said, I would never say that to a client as a therapist. I, that probably wouldn't. Is that a no, no to, to say? <laughs> oh, you can say that for your own experience. I'm just saying that when I tend to work with people, I find that typically when people are depressed, they have, along with that, a very strong inner critic that's in, injecting quite a bit of shame at the same time. Yeah. Um, so to suggest personal responsibility for the state might quite easily strengthen that inner critic that's already injected the whatever else is going on that they're experiencing with a lot of added shame. And then that really, then they're really going to be stuck, you know? So, so I'm just where I tend to work with self-compassion quite a bit. Um, but yeah, if you stand back to, to the outside perspective, you could say, yeah, maybe there's a secondary gains going on here from, you know, psychodynamic perspective that there is something that they're getting out of this in a sort of a warped way in the context. Um, but just if I was working with somebody, I wouldn't say that. <laughs> It wouldn't be helpful. <laughs> it wouldn't be helpful at that time. <laughs> but was it true? I mean, was, you know, I was just kind of reporting my own perspective. Yeah, yeah. no, I understand. Um, I, think it, I, I think it is. I think it is true. I think, I think Wallace took some pride in his uh, morbid, I mean, infinite jest is an amazing study of, of uh, depression and suicide. And, and I think he took pride in that. And then he was a little offended when people thought it was a big, it was funny. <laughs> it was, he was very sort of taken back by that. It wasn't, he wasn't trying to be funny. He was, tr he was, he was trying to write really well about uh, depression and, and addiction and recovery, and he he wrote exceptionally about it. Uh, but yeah, I think I think he took some you know some pride in his expertise. Um, I'm going to speak just from my experience, and I agree with you, Mark, about Wallace. But this is something that came out of my experience. <clears throat> and depression and even attempting my life that I have not lost sight of. To engage having power over death and, and fight it tooth and nail drives you to a point like Wallace that I'm going to figure a way to conquer this. And it's really important I do this, suicide or not. Because the in my experience, I felt the most in control when I could say, fuck it, I'm out of here. On my terms, nobody else's, not even deaths. But, you know, that can be argued one way or the other. But that's, I'm just saying that that was the, I think that's the I think that's the third circle, the, the loss of the fear. You conquer it. You're no longer afraid of dying, which yes. is which is uh, and and uh, Wallace speaks of the cage. You're in the cage mm -hmm. and, and the only way out you see is through dying. And and yeah, you take power. You take the power in your own hands. You're no longer afraid of it. And wasn't it Freud that, you know, there's a preservation for life, but he felt that there was also alongside 
death. An instinct, yeah, to, yeah. to return to whence you came. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Wherever that was, I don't know. <laughs> I'm not sure. What's the symbolic level of the act? Like, what is it supposed to mean? To me, what it meant of going through it, to me, was that all the intense, intense pain and suffering that I felt others was inflicting on me by not by isolating me because of you know, being like my dad or, or, or having no control over my life because my son was taken from me, you know, a, a convergence of circumstances that I had no skill level of how to navigate. The symbolic meaning is I am going to be in control somehow. And it's hard for people. It's just hard for people that if, if to, feel into the depth of that from my point of view. Well, and there's also the sadness, right? Yes. Uh, it, right. Derwin. Yes. And, uh, certainly unresolved grief, I think is a significant one. Uh, I agree. Many men, again, conditioned not to feel sadness. Um, you get mad, not sad. Bad, not sad, right? And you know, thinking about like, you know, the the first wave of the men's movement, starting with Robert Bly. I mean, that was kind of his key message, you know, over all that period was, you know, we need to acknowledge our grief. We need to allow ourselves to feel sad when something's happened that we've lost something. You know, it's a normal part of the process. And then if we can go through the sadness, then there's usually a relief or joy on the other side. But you have to go all the way through it, <laughs> you know, and we don't necessarily want to do that or culturally not allowed to do that. You know, and I was counseling people in the workplace and they'd had losses, you know, they still had, they had to get back to work. So <laughs> um, it wasn't, didn't necessarily have an easy time, um, have enough space to do their mourning process properly. Yeah, my my dad had a metaphor that I ended up <laughs> putting it back on him. He had a metaphor, bite the bullet. Bite the bullet that just is the metaphor that we're, everything you're talking about. Yeah. Mm -hmm. mm. Now, originally, it was only used, it was only used if you had to you got on the battlefield, they gave you a bullet to bite down so that it could take a bullet out. <laughs> you know, the pain of the, yes. <laughs> right. I, I heard some will to power kind of sentiment, you know, like that in this, it's like as a response to the feeling I'm maybe just theorizing here of, of ultimate powerlessness. Mm -hmm. You can't fix your life. You've kind of, it's become a knot that you can't disentangle. Yes. Um, I'm yeah. thinking back to a few cafe sessions ago, we had um, Linclair Dennis and she talks about these knots and then she talks about them in these mystical geometric terms. But I think that, you know, when our, our life situation becomes so, difficult uh that you cannot envisage a way to achieve like some kind of enjoyment satisfaction pleasure in yeah. existing just in your own being then that doesn't kill the desire to have some power over your circumstances and some ability to express and fulfill yourself the only way left it seems then becomes through this this act and unfortunately uh it's a terminal act can um, be yeah i you know i think i mean I, I i think that there's another option right and it's in this paper that john shared it's in wallace uh at least as far as what he's left us artistically 
uh, but it's the creative option, right? Because depression has temporal and spatial qualities. Mm -hmm. Temporally, it means not having a future, being entangled in, locked into a past that, you know, like a groundhog that you can't, that doesn't, a, a cyclical sort of motion that doesn't open to some kind of fundamental change, variation, or novelty. I think that's the, the temporal quality or aspect of depression. Spatially, I was reminded that Peter Sloterdijk has a parenthesis, a few pages in, uh, in his volume Globes on depression, and I remember reading it thinking it was one of the most eloquent and interesting takes on depression because it, it's, it's uh, put in terms of his spherology, his spherology or the idea that human beings always exist in these spheres of um, these inner spheres of, of shared meaning uh, and shared life with other, other beings. Always, there's always an, an other that you're sharing it with from birth all the way into, you know, uh, mystical experience but um but for him this the, the meaning of depression is that you lose all space that the world becomes reduced to a single point of yourself and there isn't an other or there isn't a sort of something you can move out into there isn't a well-rounded uh domain where you're able to be yourself express yourself live you know, have the pleasures and the experiences of, of, of being alive. Um, but there is an alternative to, to take in one's own life. Uh, and I think, um, to, you know, I, I think that what, what would be therapeutic is to, is to increase the space that one feels and to give oneself a future. And the question I, I, to me would be, how does one do that? What, what does that look like for, you know, in each case, for each person? And maybe more broadly, we have to look at the cultural and social. Because like I think, Mark, you were alluding to in more traditional or tribal societies, I would say wherever they appear, it doesn't have to be the continent of Africa. It could be like Armenia. Uh, was a good example and from Bourdain's piece. Uh, they expressed the same thing. That, that, remember that dinner that uh, Bourdain attended with Serge and, and the family? And the grandma is talking about how people have become much more individualistic. There isn't the same kind of community or communication or the ability just to rely on other people, just to know that they're there. Because every So that, that's an expression of a, of a whole arguably a whole civilization, a whole philosophy, an ontology, you know, a way of constructing the universe that turns people into these isolated monads, these isolated individuals who are each pursuing their own interests. And that's, you know, like modern capitalism, right? But what's beyond that? Like, what would be beyond that individually, personally? What would be beyond that socially, culturally? Uh, because it seems to me that we live in a, in a quote unquote advanced civilization that is producing depression. It's like a depression machine. It creates a lot of pleasure, a lot of opportunities for, you know, having experiences of entertainment, of travel, of food, of everything that Bourdain uh, showcased on his show is like, these are the wonders of the world. This is everything you could experience in the world, all the different people you can meet, all the different food you could sample. Um, and, and this endless variety that, that, that's produced. But if the individual, if everything feels like the same old thing, if there is no real genuine newness to move toward, and that to me is the essence of what creativity has to provide. It has to show the world anew, show really why it's worth living. Uh, and I, I want to do that. I feel like that's, that's, uh, that's been maybe my inner motivation, um, my own way of creating a sphere of expand, you know, of, of not sinking into a 
point of infinite nothingness that has no joy and nothing to give and nothing to love like that. I know what that means. And uh, I know that there must be something more. And, and so um, how would we, how would we really bring that forth, bring that more, that. Um, Marco, that, that, that's interesting because I, I like the way you put that, but my question became for me after I failed at doing what I was trying to do, you know, in my life, my question was, began, began a deep inner, what you're saying of bringing creativity, a, 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 a turning towards a, a, a creativity that is generative rather than destructive. Because I feel that in some ways I was put in a situation and fortunately I fail. I always, I, I, I'm glad I failed, <laughs> to put it that way. But it, 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 it took me to the dark side of creativity that can be destructive in my own hands. And because I failed in that moment, I began a long journey doing exactly what I feel you were articulating. Good. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, 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 you just put into words that I've only intuitively sensed. So this is just coming out of me right now. Well, that's just my take too. I mean, this is that's all right. I, I don't care if it's your take or not. It works for me. <laughs> I can see that. And I, I just saw a little side note here. Nietzsche also said human beings will endure almost any how they live as long as they have a why. Yeah. This is what Viktor Frankl came up with in his uh, uh, search for meaning. Um, you know, in the concentration camps in uh, in Nazi Germany. There wasn't a lot of suicide that was done. I mean, people were being offed, but the ones who didn't voluntarily, or you know, you had you had a lot of options to just do it, but you but you didn't because for some reason you found a why and why I should be here, and it's finding that why. And why is one of those questions that we we in modern society for the most part of them whether it be the United States or Western Europe or wherever, um, we, we tend not to ask because it's a complicated question, but it's one that we really fundamentally want to answer for ourselves in some way. And, and since we, we aren't ready to ask it, a lot of times I think we have to, we have to help other people find a way to ask the question itself. You know, I, I like, Back in college, like Marco, I went to see a therapist and it was basically, it would be better if you didn't come because I'm just going to end up getting depressed and probably have to go into therapy. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I said, okay, well, I guess I'm going to have to deal with this on my own. And in, in, in our own inept ways, we, we, we tend to do that until it doesn't go any further. But when I, uh, I got out of the military, I, I mentioned I was teaching at a, at a private boarding school. And the thing about the private boarding school that I was at is that the students that were there were organized in what they called families. So we weren't only teachers there. We just didn't teach our subjects. We also had a family of students that lived in the same house or in the same wing of the castle on the same floor or whatever. This was in a, an enclosed compound, so to speak, up on top of it. It was a castle on top of the hill. It was very Mr. Chippish um, in some regards. Um, but we had a lot of very disturbed children there because as I said, they were either very rich or very poor. So their parents sent them there because they didn't want to have them around or they got sent there because the authorities said, this is your last chance before you go to a closed institution. And, and there was one, one house that was kind of separate from the castle and I was only there about a month. I had a very nice family. I was starting to get along with them. And the head of the school came and he said, uh, you're, you're going to take over what was called the Forester's House. And I said, OK, well, you know, I'll do whatever I'm told to do. I just got out of the military. I'm not in the, you know, questioning a lot of things. I'll, you know, yes, sir, we'll do this. 
but as it so so happened, this this house is where they put all the very socially disturbed people. They just kind of isolated them out of the the main population, and and kind of focused them into one group. And so I had I had fourteen year old bedwetters. I had a person that foamed at the mouth when, when in the morning when people just looked at him cross-eyed and, and he could and he could scream i mean this guy woke up anybody who didn't get up for the morning run got up when they when they you know pissed off on the uh, kind of thing and and one of the the kids in the in the family the first time i met him i hadn't been moved into the house i hadn't moved into the house yet but the first time i met him was during a conference a teacher's conference that we had in the mornings, and a student knocked on the door and said, you have to come over. Um, uh, Thomas is going to kill himself. And there was this young kid in my family who ended up being in my family. And the first time I saw him, he was standing on a chair with a noose around his neck. And he was going to kill himself. And and so we we got him to get what? down off the chair. <laughs> Some, this is, let me clarify this. It's, the kid gets on a chair and puts a yeah. rope around his neck hanging from him. Yeah. And did people just, somebody walk in and go, Oh, look at that. And then go get you. And yes. Then, they, they, yeah. And then so, you so the go, I think this is a critical situation. Maybe we need to have an adult around. You know, <laughs> it was really one of these kind of things. Yeah. It seems kind of bizarre, but I can tell you one thing, uh, Mark, uh, here in Germany, we, in Germany tends to handle life a little differently than we do in the States. I notice that everywhere I go and what we do, I, I took my, my brother was here last week. That's why I was in the cafe. We went up to see my kid's kindergarten and to pick him up. And he walks out into the playground and he goes, his first words was, holy shit, you can't do this where I come from. Because there was one hazard after another. He goes, this is a lawsuit. There's a lawsuit. There's a lawsuit. I go, well, you can't sue in Germany, so we don't have them. <laughs> so, so kids kind of learn to deal with danger in different ways. And so we got him down off the table and uh, off the chair. And of course, I was very concerned. And every Wednesday night was family night. So we <clears> had to get together to, to do a family kind of thing. I wasn't married at the time. And, you know, my wife came over on, you know, to help me out with all these things. And and this kid that was on the on the chair, he spent the first eight weeks that I knew him. The only verbal communication I ever heard come out of his mouth was when he talked to the radiator in my living room. And he was a seven, he was in seventh grade and he was highly, yeah, he was highly dyslexic. He was, he had, and he had a wonderful family. You know, his, his father was a high ranking uh, government official and, 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 you know, they, they were very concerned and they had, they had given him here in hopes that something could happen with him. And the, the teacher that had taken care of that family who, who left on a moment's notice because he couldn't handle it anymore, um, that's why I ended up with the family, uh, we had to deal with this. And, and, and his only friend, if you can call it that, was probably the most sadistic person I've ever met in my entire life. Uh, he loved to torture, and he, tor he would torture anything he possibly could if he could get his fingers on it, including other people. And so... You know, we had this this really kind of I'm a I'm a GI English teacher, you know, who ends up here and said, well, what do you do with these people? And and I found that. And, and this is a, the thing that has come up again and again and almost everything that everyone has said, and it goes back to that very. You know, those criteria that you mentioned at first from Joyner, it's the, you know, it's the isolation, alienation. This person just felt disconnected, to totally disconnected from everything. He di disconnected from his peers, disconnected from his parents, disconnected from anything that was ever expected of him. He also, as it turns out in the, in the course of time, felt that he was, he was a burden. He was always in the way. But... But the other side of the coin was the guy was a kind of electrical genius. We had to, we had to do things with our hands in the afternoon. So every, everybody was in a kind of like a, a club kind of thing. And one of them was the, what's called the, the electronics club. And they did a lot of, they learned how to do wiring and things like that. And I wanted to put up a big advents wreath in the, in the hallway going to the house that we're in so that I could just screw in a light bulb and that would be one light. And on the second 
Sunday of Advent, you could turn in two uh, things. And he goes, oh, I can do that. He, he just said that to me. I can do that. And I said, OK, well, then why don't you do it? Because I need this. So my my wife, Macra, made this this massive wreath. And I said, well, you've got to wire it and I'm going to hang it up on this and this day. And he did. And 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 through that. We we connected. So there was there was a connection there. Now, one of the one of the there were there were sins against um, there are little sins and big sins, but the biggest sin of all in the in the in the boarding school was that if you snuck out from the boarding school in the middle of the night and went somewhere, that was grounds for being thrown out. And so he started telling me, I can sneak out and you can't catch me. I said, Well, maybe you can and maybe you can't. And he kept telling me this, you know, I can, I can do this. I can do this. And, and he, he, but he knew this is the grounds for dismissal. I could I could lose everything that I have for doing that. And then one night I went down to kind of check on the kids after night and he wasn't there. So I took a little piece of paper out of his notepad and he said, you know, you weren't here, but I was, ha ha. And I put it down and he came in the next day <laughs> as sheepish as everything. And he goes, how did you know I wasn't there? I said, cause you kept telling me you were going to leave. I said, you have to be careful about what you tell people because they just might listen to what you're saying. It was through this kind of process. It was simply this, I call it simply, taking the person, it's a person, this is a human being, and just deal with them as a human being, which I have to admit, all of you folks that are in therapy of gone is a hell of a thing to have to do because you can't always do it the way I could. He was part of my family. I could use that as a, as a you, you know, you're one of my kids. I had three of my own and uh, 13 others, but you're all my family. I'm responsible for you. I have to do something with you. And so we were able to, to develop this connection. And it's through this, this, if you can find anyone, anywhere, for any reason that will connect with you, then... I think it's the obligation of the person who's doing the connecting to continue the connection. And it's for the other person to at least be willing to accept that somebody might be interested enough to do that. I, I, to me, it's a, it's a first step, but it's to me also really quote unquote, the only way to overcome this because our, our primary illness, Gapeser talks about this as well. Our primary illness in modern, wherever we are here in, you know, our, space-time continuum uh, 2018 is we just feel all disconnected and we're made to feel disconnected. Our, our, our culture has developed to a point where disconnectedness is, is, is raised almost to an ideal. You know, I'm my own self or I'm just my own being or whatever. No, it's, who cares? It's very, it's very paradoxical. Because it, isn't it? This, this, we're interfacing now, we're yeah. connecting, and it is a, a form of it, but it also has the, the flip side is it can lead people into isolation yeah. because all, they're just, now for me, this is part of my therapy. <laughs> <laughs> you too, huh? You said no therapy. <laughs> but, well, I'm not, pra- I'm not practicing it. No. This is part of my, my, you know, I'm using it specifically to keep connected with people so I don't get totally dis- disconnected. But, I ha- that, but I'm very selective now. I, I almost totally shut down Facebook. I quit Twitter because I, I was getting negative feedback. And... Uh, and I don't know. This group is, you know, a little, a little, <laughs> sh- weird enough to handle. A little shaky, but so far, you know, I'm hanging in there. Right. It's like and, a positive and, disconnect from a, a <laughs> negative. Well, the tech tech connection term really. is negative reinforcement. <laughs> uh, when you quitting Facebook is negative reinforcement. It's like an alarm clock. The alarm clock goes off. You you remove the stimulus, and you feel better. And and but there, it's nobody nobody thought nobody has thought through all of this 
new age were were entered into. It's just it's just rolling on, you know. And well, nobody, we're, we're dancing on our feet, <laughs> you know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know. Yeah. Dancing on the head of a pin, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> Does that mean we're all angels, Mark? <laughs> sure. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I just want to share one other. I mean, we've talked about disconnection, moving to connection, uh, lack of meaning, moving to more sense of purpose, right? And Marco addressed creativity. I want to just suggest one other kind of meta technique, I guess. Um, that's certainly one that I would say that I practiced a lot. Uh, and that would be, um, I guess, letting go would be a way to say it. Um, radical acceptance or acceptance i don't like the word surrender because i don't think spirit or life is is you know fighting with me um and i have to surrender to it um but uh yeah and if if, i don't know if you're familiar with uh otto Scharmer's u theory but the the letting go takes you down to the the bottom of the u which would be that kind of orobindo bliss and causal awareness and then the creativity coming out the other side of bringing that into form. Um, so the letting go and the creativity are really kind of the two parts of one process. Um, yeah, so it's an, it's another way of getting that control that you were talking about, Michael, by kind of radically giving up all control. Um, I mean, yeah. the Christians would just say, I mean, it's a trite statement, but yeah. let go and let God, right? It's very trite. Yeah. <laughs> what does it actually mean? But it can, you can actually do it. You know, it's, it's something, it's, we have the power to actually do that. Well, that's uh, what. Uh, and there, there uh, go ahead, Mark. I'm sorry. I was just going to, in, in uh, the whole recovery movement, AA, uh, yeah, Wallace, Wallace. Yeah. It says it's living by cliches. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. And it's very, it's very true. I mean, cliches for a reason. Yeah, and they're 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 kind of condensed little reminders. This is what I can do for myself. And one of the ones that I came up with, out of uh, reading Casanita and the Yaki way of knowledge, is controlled abandonment. I I I still have control, but I'm abandoning it. <laughs> You know, letting the control relax, you know, um, especially after what I went through. um, It really uh, just put back in my face that, Mike, breathe, relax. You still have, you still can work with the situation (laughs) rather than have the situation overwhelm you. Well, I think, I think it is an impulse mm-hmm. to take one's life. Those things have to converge, but if you have, if, and that's where the isolation is so deadly. If, if, if you have that, that friend or that other or somebody just get you past that impulse to do that, then, well, but, yeah. but it may return. It, Mark, you're 100% right because I've just turned it around and I don't know how, uh, I've turned it around that that's what I'm going to be for somebody else. Mm -hmm. I'm going to be that person to the best of my ability to give them what, no blame, no judgment that I didn't get for myself or I didn't feel or perceived would probably be a better way. I think that's the sponsor uh, uh, motif. Oh, yeah, AA is you've got that you've got that uh, three a.m. friend. Yeah, uh, I turn my phone off so it <laughs> don't count on me. What about your music? <laughs> I, uh, I don't know. Well, you know, I think I mean a couple things. One, it's useful to have these nuggets of wisdom or these truths, these verities. <laughs> that in a moment of crisis, in a moment of impulse intensity, uh, can arise. Like, it's, it's simple enough 
that it can arise in your awareness and it can be a kind of anchor or a counterweight to whatever it is you want to do. And this doesn't just go for addiction or for depression. I think it goes for all kinds of impulses. Uh, And and that's part of, I think, maybe training processes, coming to grapple with those those verities uh, and recognizing their inner truth uh, underneath the, you know, the, 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 uh, the well-worn uh, and cliche exterior. The other thing that I think is interesting is the capacity to spiritualize a psychological process or perhaps to recognize the in, inner spiritual significance of um, what at another level might just appear to be a personal problem like that you diagram is very similar right. to the dark night of the soul uh, kind of idea uh, very similar to what the dark night of the soul oh, okay. idea and the you know the going down into into the darkness into the, the void into the, the nihil and that is you just think of what depression means it literally means going into a kind of sinkhole it means going down mm-hmm. uh, and how in the annals of mysticism, you know, that is always a part of the process of coming to know the divine. Uh, it requires letting go of one's images, one's concepts, one's language, one's connection to, or one's pre- prior, you know, assumptions of connection to reality, uh, love, truth, grace, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and experiencing some kind of radical void or emptiness or nothingness that's the dark night but then coming uh, coming out of that uh, and there being a, a dawn uh, on the other side i th- i don't know if anybody really experiences that in this like mystical purity i mean maybe it always has this personal dimension to it and as we go through our personal stories uh we're kind of like almost modeling that archetypal journey you know that journey in the, into the, the depths and then back toward mm-hmm. and I mean, perhaps it, i guess if we can understand it in those terms it maybe it softens the focus on the isolated self and it it shows how it's more part of a bigger process it's part of something that god him herself is going through uh in the cosmic process I, I feel like that might be one mm, gift that we could you know, gather from Aurobindo's writing or any of the great mystics who, who describe this because they kind of almost provide a template for like a psychoanalysis of, of you know, depression and transcendence. I have, I have to go soon, but I'd like to respond to that if I can. Um, so I haven't read, is, who's Dark Knight of the Soul? Is that Merton? Or, I don't know. Is it Saint Teresa? Or is, no, oh, Saint John. Okay. Saint so it goes back a little further. John of the Cross. John of the Cross. Exactly. <laughs> but anyways, um, and, uh, Father Thomas Keating goes through that quite a bit too in his stuff. Um, he's uh, in Colorado. There, I think he's still alive. So. Oh, so it's Father Thomas Keating. I thought it was Robert uh, Keating Keat- that you've been referenced. Oh, Keating, Keating, Father Thomas Keating. Keating oh, okay, uh, okay. Take, takes up the Christian Dark Night of the Soul in uh, Invitation to Love. Gotcha. But I've got a few things to say about that, which maybe stems off this whole hibernation idea that I have, at least for myself, that's kind of, I, I, it's almost a depression in a way, but it, maybe it's a creative depression that it can be, recognizing our daily cycle is kind of that dip in and out. We, we go into a certain amount of sleep and that's the dark part. And we don't know what's going on. Maybe we're dipped back into the, the cosmic divine or whatever, or maybe we're just sleeping, but it's the same thing with meditation, at least the way I practice it, uh, which is maybe 10 or 15 minutes a day. I'll just lay down lights off as quiet as I can get it. Um, and try to tap into some sort of nothingness, not not a negative or a positive sense, just try to erase everything. Um, and then out of that, 
arises some sort of creative potential. Um, so, at least for me personally, recently, it's this idea of going outside of our human exist outside of the human, not necessarily like what would it be like to be a, a bat or even an autistic person we're reading um, the minor gesture in the last chapter that uh, a certain reading group is focusing on focuses on the the autistic perception and there I, I had a quote earlier that, that I posted I think that says we are outside of the normal flow of time we can't express ourselves and our bodies are hurtling us through life and I that's the autistic perception to where they verbally cannot express. They, they express themselves through strange gestures that we typical human, or at least those with the normal perception of life, normal, um, we, we don't understand, but through these writings that the autistic person is allowed to produce, they, they're expressing their internal states. And they're they're hurtling through space just like we are. Just in a, it's almost reminds me of a psychedelic experience that they're going through, but constantly. And they they slowly learn how to adapt through creative means or through the interpersonal connection. Um. So I don't know where I'd like to go with that, but I I was also, which we don't have to bring this into the conversation now, but there's been a lot of mention on the site. Uh, indirectly about the role of psychedelics and in society it's almost a versus the depressant substances that we use whether it's alcohol or this or that and that that psychoactive side is more creative in a sense and I guess in where I'd maybe like to see the conversation go I'm, I'm not going to be able to be present for it but uh, if we do have time, or if any of you would like to talk about that, it's just the creative, that, that goes back to the creative option, I guess you were talking about, Marco. Uh, yeah, I've enjoyed the conversation. It's been lively. <laughs> so, <laughs> see y'all. Nice to meet you, Michael. Nice to meet you, Doug. Doug. Next time, wear some glasses. Bring your glasses. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There you go. Hey. Yeah. Okay. I already have the bushy eyebrows, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, you're in. <laughs> I I have a question for you, uh, Marco, uh, it, it, regarding creativity. Do you think it resides in everyone, and and it's just not expressed, or or do you think there are uh, I guess, do you think it's, uh, well, that's the question. Do you think everybody has the creative gene? <laughs> you don't uh, have to answer. Yeah, well, I kind of do. Uh, Not that know, creative do. answer for that. I, I don't, I, don't <laughs> I do, but... It depends what we're talking about with, with creativity. There's a sort of cosmic meaning to creativity. We're all constantly emerging as novel beings in becoming in this larger process. Uh, Alfred Whitehead, for example, philosopher, you know, writes about... Well, I know this through Wilbur, not through reading uh, Whitehead directly, but... You know, he he thinks that the cosmos, like the the flow of time, is the process of. And I think Derwin, you actually said something very similar to this uh, of potentiality emerging into novelty. But there's also habit. So there's always pattern, repetition, or habit. What's similar to what just came before, but then also the potential for for novelty. So I think everybody is is doing that. I think that. Yep. People who identify or who are identified as creative or as artistic in the social meaning of those terms are those who specialize in breaking habits of perception in particular through some kind of media, 
through some kind of media, media uh, means. So if it's in language, what a poet or a fiction writer does is they say the same thing, pretty much that's been being said for you know ten thousand years, but they say it in a new way. They make it you know as Elliot Pound put it, make it fresh or make it new. I think was his his creed. Uh, maybe that's a very modern interpretation too, because this notion of novelty of newness is a very modern idea. Uh, but if you're just asking me what I think, I think everybody is creative in that general sense, but that it can also be cultivated in individuals. And so as somebody who identifies as, or is, uh, aspiring towards, uh, an art- artistic kind of life, I cultivate that. So I, I want to change my mind. I want to break up patterns of thought. I want to question uh, what's maybe become settled or become apparent, you know, stale. But that's just one, you know, that, that's also one aspect of a polarity, I would say, because you can't just have novelty without some kind of stability, without so that kind of pattern repetition. And so I think there are other special other people who specialize in creating patterns and structures and systems and that in the larger sort of integration if i was like trying you know stepping outside of my personal preferences my personal identities i would see more of a di- more of a dialectic between novelty or creativity and structure or let's say regularity or order uh so the, the artist, I think, or the creative person really works with chaos and order because they're kind of creating new orders, but th- they have to introduce a, a, an element of chaos into a settled system in order to sort of push it towards a, high, a different order or a higher order. Uh, and that is a, takes a certain kind of skill set that I think you know, these different tr- traditions or lineages of artistic practice actually cultivate. Uh, doesn't uh, doesn't Pablo Picasso kind of condense it in learn learn the rules like a professional but break them like an artist? Yeah, that's right. And I, I think I think um, that's a lot of people miss that first step. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. No, I, I I totally agree. But that seemed to, as I'm listening to you, that phrase kept coming up. <laughs> Yeah, I, that's helped me through my life, actually. Yeah, uh, it's 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 difficult because I, I think that one of the things that we are losing culturally is tradition. Yes, yes, I agree. And you know, even the things twenty years ago, you would you would know what a mainstream tradition was. Like there would there was there was something like a, that you could say was the literary world. Yeah, the art world. Some domain of established judgments of quality and of right. fact and a kind of story to to you know to the culture i think that we're living in a time when that's breaking apart and disintegrating and yeah so, and it feels fragmented right totally yes uh and i think that that i mean that's that's why anybody could do something that appears different on the surface but actually isn't grounded in having learned something Yes, like a deep tradition to then make a var- to then change. Right. Uh, I think that, that the neo authoritarian movement is a response to that, trying to reestablish a a tradition. I think something that's like what, that. That's kind. Of, I, well, no, I think that's I, actually I kind of off the topic there. But, but so. we're talking. About, I mean, look, we were, we were six right. men here, and there's something culturally happening around men, women, gender. Uh, identi- identities uh, and the politics around around all that and yeah you know af- so there's a sort of i think uh way in which well the politics of it are, are complicated because men are associated with i'm not making i'm not trying to make an argument here like but they're associated with having positions of power privilege historical uh dominance etc and Again, I'm not going to make any kind of say that that's true or not true, but just if we were to look at that story, and then if you show the show the the transition from a world in which that might be the case, 
might be the case to one which power becomes much more distributed and much more, uh, uh, let's say, um, contested, then one could build a case that the reason, one of the reasons for male depression is because of uh, those kinds of dynamics playing out and because of the social shifts in status that are occurring. Uh, I think that there's, my opinion, there's more to it than that because it also has to include geopolitical conflicts and macroeconomic trends. And there's a lot of things that are, I think, impacting upon the inherent desire for dignity or for in integrity that uh, any being has. Uh, and then men have in a, in a particular way and women have in a particular way. And the, uh, any mix of genders or you know, ex gender expressions is going to have. And we're figuring out how to create a society that is inclusive and respectful of what, you know, of the whole diversity of people's needs for integrity. I think that that's sort of the, uh, what's going on. Um, and well, I'm, I'm, job. <laughs> a question just popped into my mind. On the one hand, it seems like you're saying our society, let's just stay here in the West in America. <laughs> We're trying to figure out ways of slicing up the power pie and and that's caught the consequence of that is is negative in a lot of ways. It was when there was tradition, it was sort of much simpler uh, for people, and there was much less conflict inner and outer because there were rules tradition and now there's a, a a movement to disrupt that it's basically take away the hierarchical structure of power and slice it up all right and, let's and get started it, who said that no, sorry <laughs> sorry <laughs> well i would question whether i mean whether there was a tradition or a time when tradition ensured an orderly world. I, 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 I'm thinking back, I cannot actually remember, and everything I know of history, there's no, at no point after like 10,000 BC can I a point to identify a period in time that has any, you know, has significant duration that lasts and where there is peace, prosperity, happiness, well-being. Well, I didn't say that. Like, I didn't say. So, I didn't say that. I so said I'm, right, but then, of, but then the idea of there being this kind of order in the past that we could re that we could go back to or that we have to preserve, I I think it's suspect. That's all. I, I I'm not sure that I I would kind of rely on that from just an intellectual point so. of view. I think, did I introduce a shift in what we were talking about just a little bit? <laughs> <laughs> talking about the political part, and I don't know how long, I think we're going to be wrapping up in a little bit too, right? We should, yeah. So just briefly on depression, I wanted to just say um, uh, physical exercise, you know, just so maybe, maybe it's obvious, but we sit too much. We, I've stood up now because I've been sitting. Um, and, you know, we just have intended to move our bodies enough. Um, certainly my recovery at that time in my twenties, I was, you know, that my, the psychologist was really into that and he was kind of ahead of his time at that time, even then, um, you know, you go to the doctor, they wouldn't say exercise more. They will now, <laughs> but it didn't used to be part of it. It's the strangest thing, but, uh, definitely that, you know increases the positive chemicals in the in the in the system in the brain and just through exercise so i just wanted to put that one out there too in terms of the uh kind of toolkit and yeah and if we want to talk about the historical part i just think if we start that it's going to be a big conversation we probably do a whole one on that <laughs> yeah yeah good point just a thought
Well, I think with the exercise part, staying with that, part of, part of depression is low energy. And so, and without, without the connection to someone forcing you to do that, yeah. it's like if you did it on your own, that's great. But a person deep down in the valley of despair it takes a, it takes a, uh, I don't want to use the word highly evolved, but you're kind of into the, the self-awareness, self-actualization. If you realize that you need to get your ass up and out, even when you're depressed. Yeah. <laughs> and, and so that's kind of the, the another, uh, another, uh, riddle for yeah. the depressed person yeah so like you were saying i think earlier marco there's a spiral and there's a self-fulfilling prophecy mm-hmm. I, I, wallow is a word that comes to mind yeah or kind of auger, it kind of augers down you know yeah <laughs> Yeah. But, the, but the key that I keep hearing in all of this is you have to connect to one yes. other. Yes. Yeah. One. Thank you. Not Thank a, you. to be another. Some other, whomever or whatever it may be. It, it, may be, it may be your artistic genie. It may be your daemon, as uh, Socrates put it. It may be another human being. It could be who yes. knows. What, but there has to be some other. And, and what we're missing, I think, a lot these days is, is recognizing what others can be, just to get a start, give you a chance. You can run through a whole slew of them before you find out which one kind of works for you. But, but without working. that, you know, we're, we're really, you know, you're fighting an uphill battle, I think. Well, I, think- I want to do a last plug for art and creativity because I find that the art like for me i'll just the other has been found often in a writer or an artist or a filmmaker who's able to reflect back to me the the shape of my own soul in some respect and who i think oh this person gets it this person knows what it means to be alive this person has you know has um well if i can interrupt just briefly i think that's what wallace did in with our reading group with wallace there were a lot, there were a lot of introverted, neurotic people in that group, but but hearing him articulate it actually inspired people. Mm-hmm. They felt like, oh, that's the friend I was looking for. Right. Is that and what you? I mean, and then the fact the fact that we were reading it together, I thought, yeah, created a kind of yeah. container for people to connect with each other mm-hmm. because yeah. they had this shared yeah. relation. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I guess that's what religion does in, in a certain way. Um, mm-hmm. yeah. And there was a lot of religion in this, in infinite jest. Uh, and all, everything we, uh, that I've read with groups like this, it's always been, although not explicitly and not approached in a religious manner. Like I'm not, you know, we're not trying to, create an edifice of beliefs or, or but mm-hmm. it seems to me the literature and the philosophy and the poetry and the psychology it's all ways of of illuminating bringing forth uh bringing attention and and shared attention i think to that dimension that aspect of of our experience uh so that you know once it's given voice once it's put in language or given an image or given some kind of aesthetic quality there could be mutual resonance with it and it bring it, it sort of opens things up i mean people like we're talking about there remember in that group they were talking about on facebook this was in a facebook group and part of why i felt it was so inadequate the platform was so <laughs> inadequate for what actually people wanted needed to do mm-hmm. but they were opening up about their own experiences with depression and with suicide out suicide uh and of various kinds of you know very intimate kinds of experiences that you would usually wouldn't talk about with with other folks and here we were group for all intents and purposes of strangers 
brought together only by a common text talking about those things. And I felt like it was really valuable. I mean, to me, it sort of gave me a, a new vision for life. And uh, I think that the feedback I got from some of the people was that it meant something to them and changed something for them. So uh, that's part of why I like doing this is because I think it has that, it addresses that need. And I think out of it can come this creative act because I think like Wallace is an example in a way he's a, you know, he's kind of a, both a positive and as well as a warning example, like a, what do you call it? Um, yeah. Uh, but I, I feel that if, if people can find what's valuable in themselves, like find like what they can uniquely do nice. or say or bring forth, like that's what saves you ultimately. Mm. Uh, and I feel like these, you know, having these examples of people that really face demons and face complexities and really try to make something of it, try to do something with it, um, that, um, you know, th that, that shows us that it can be done. Um, Mario, on that level, on that note, I, I, to complete my thought, my children, my son, became, I turned toward being a good parent was my artistic mm -hmm. um what's that light <laughs> you know the light yeah. on the shore you know uh lighthouse when, you can uh that 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 resonates with what to me it resonates with what you're pointing to he became the other that i watch him grow up he's 32 now and i had i attempted my act when he was six months old mm. because of a lot of stuff. Wow. But that's a why, I think. Yeah. And, and, and that's that's exactly what I just wanted to say, Margaret. It's a why. Yeah. And it, it appears to be so banal that we're just reading a book. That, that seems to be such a banal act. People do that every single day. But people don't always read a book in a group. Yeah. And it takes on a whole new dimension. And it's right. like, like my student back at the school he had to wire the the wreath it was just it, it's a it's a very hands-on thing to do it's not a complicated thing for all of us who are old enough to know a, a little bit about elect, electrical circuits and i want to show you a picture yeah but for a 12 year old it was a big deal and when he did it he got recognition from the group that he had accomplished something oh cool this made me think of you because I've heard you say the same thing. This was done by our artists at, at, here in Riverside of the hands touching mm -hmm. the brain because right. hand eye coordination uh, is very important even to yeah. realize concepts. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm a big fan of motor skills for higher cognitive capabilities. And so he, he, he does the wreath and all of a sudden the isolated individual did something that no one else could do. Yeah, you become a special. You, all of a sudden, he was he was right in in the center but, the spotlight. Then, then, does why open up? Why create? Well, that's it. Once I do anything that gives me a why, I can do really anything else I want to. Okay, I, because I I have something. I I've got the hook. I've got yeah. a why hook. I can use it. You know, so we we do that. Well, I, have to, I have to tell you another little story about the guy. He was he was terribly dyslexic. He was you could not read anything he wrote. And for the most part, his homework that he turned in were these pictures of of of, of airplanes strafing people and blowing them up and shooting them. That that's what he actually like did for homework in English most of the time. Until we got this very sweet, naive. Uh, intern from Minnesota who wanted to spend a little time abroad. She had, you know, taken a course in German and she ends up at the school and, and my, my kid Hans is in her, in her class. And of course the first homework that he does is just these strafe bombing people being blown up knives in there, whatever, and blood and guts and spitting out or whatnot. And she's horrified at this. She comes over every, 
every day after school. And she goes, what am I going to do? What am I going to do with Hans? What am I going to do? Just leave him alone. You know, <laughs> just, just take it easy. Yeah. You know, we'll, we'll sort this out sooner or later. And then she came, she came over one Saturday morning. She was completely beside herself. I've never seen a, a, a woman so upset as this woman. And she says, look what, look, look what Hans just gave me for his homework. And it was, it was every obscene English word that you could imagine. I don't know where he got most of them. <laughs> put together, <laughs> put together in strings of clearly written English prose. <laughs> and she just, she just like, Holy shit, what am I gonna do with it? And, and she hands us to me and she goes, look at this. And I said, and I looked at it and I go, I'm gonna take care of this right now. And I went storming downstairs, busted into Tom, in the, in the aunt's room and I said, did you write this? And he looks at it, and he gets this look in his eye. I've been caught. I've been caught. And he goes, yeah. And I said, I don't want to hear from anybody anymore that you're dyslexic. And I left. <laughs> and I said, oh, by the way, you're no longer in dyslexic instruction. You're mainstream. Yeah, yeah. He goes, well, wait a minute. I said, uh-uh. <laughs> up. You're out of there. <laughs> so I went up and said, he was pissed at me for weeks. Okay. <laughs> but. He was my best buddy after <laughs> he went back. He started writing his German clearly. <laughs> he was I a bright it. kid. Yeah, I he was a bright it. kid because he had, and this is what we were saying before, Marco. There is, once you tap into whatever that creativity is, it just ha it has room to grow. Creativity will always find room to grow if it can get fed. But you got to feed it. And if you recognize that it's there, why not feed it? G give it to him. Let him do that. You know? That was just the other anecdote with Hans. He was a trip. He was probably the favorite, my favorite student. You sound like one of these, like a, like a, a teacher in Stand and Deliver. You ever watch that? Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Never thought of it that way. I was always yeah, Mr. Trip. Right. I lived yeah. in a castle on a hill. And I could like look out over the village, you know, <laughs> but. Yeah. Okay. Um, hmm. Just, I think that creativity, I, I want to be clear, like that one, maybe another way of thinking about it. This comes from Erin Manning. Doug mentioned her is artfulness mm -hmm. because you can do anything artfully. It, it's a, it's a quality, the quality of attention that you bring to it. It's the yeah. care that you bring to it. And there's a sort of cultivating something over time, parenting, Therapy, business, basket writing, weaving, writing, <laughs> writing. <laughs> there, I yeah. mean, there are writers who are not artful. They just write. They but, write. But, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they just write. <laughs> what are they do with them? So, I, I because I think that that is means you value what you're doing. You value what you're bringing forth. Like mm -hmm. it's an expression of care. And what what is the why? There isn't actually a why, like at the end of the rainbow, it's in the thing itself. It, it's, and I think Aurobindo puts it really, to me, he answers the question, like why? It's because it's inherently delightful. It's inherently beautiful. You know, he did, it's the delight of existence. I don't think that there's any other reason that we could really find. I mean, the language is, you know, you can play with different language for it, but ultimately it's like, you you love your son and he's an expression of joy and so you want to see him grow and thrive same with exactly. daughters same with yeah, poetry mostly. same right. with anything like anything that you could care about right so that the, the seeing it grow thrive live you know right. ex, ex, fulfill its potential and you being instrumental in that uh i think is all you need yeah no, thank you. Uh, yes, I agree. <laughs> I, to I totally agree. <laughs> All right, let's wrap it up. All right. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Again, time Thanks well Mark spent. For, uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, kind of getting this conversation going. That was. Yeah. Thanks, Mark. Yep. Chapeau, is what you say. Pleasure. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> All right. Bye -bye. Okay. Nice meeting you, Mike. See you next week. Nice Thanks meeting you. Take care. Take care. Bye bye. Bye.